This video is picking up right where the previous video left off. We're in part 032, miscellaneous plotting. And in this video, I'm going to cover all kinds of three-dimensional plotting that is possible in MATLAB as well as Octave. All the code that I'm going to show you is going to work great in Octave as it does here in MATLAB, except for one little tiny bit at the end, which I will mention when I get to it. This is going to be a bit of a summary. Uh, I'm not going to delve into too much detail about most of these. So let's run the first one. So I've got this spring sort of looking diagram that I've got right here. By the way, you can always click and drag on your graphs and change what angle you're viewing them from uh, when you're looking at those three dimensional graphs. When you click and drag on a two dimensional one, you'll sort of change the frame. But with a 3D one, you'll change the angle that you're uh, appearing to look at that graph from. To generate this spring or coil, uh, I need three vectors. I need three vectors since it's in three dimensions. One for my x's, one for my y's, and one for my z's. And the way I made this one is x is just lin space from 0 to 1,000 with a step size of 10 pi. And then my y values are the cosine of those x values. And my z values, that z axis, that third dimension, is the sine of those x values. I use the plot3 command instead of plot. And then I pass it x, y, and z. Whereas with plot, I would just pass two vectors. With plot three, I pass three of them in. And I can change the line width just as I would do in a regular plot. I turned on grid, and I labeled my axes and put a title on. There is an extra axis that I can label, the z axis. Now another graph that you can make here, this is mostly, I think, just for fun. Uh, comet three, I'm gonna give it the x, y, and z values here. And what's neat about it is it's animated. That's all. Moving on down. Mesh and surface. Let's run this one. All right, so I put this on subplots here. It's the exact same data. It's just a three row matrix that I just threw together. And then to graph it, I just say mesh parentheses Z or surf parentheses Z. If I want to mesh, I use mesh. Mesh basically just doesn't color in the panels and surf does. It colors in the panels. Uh, I believe the warmer colors indicate higher values and cooler colors represent lower values on that z axis. Continuing on down. Let's look at a more interesting three-dimensional graph with mesh right here. All right, so I'm going to click on the graph and drag it around here and you can see that we now have a much more interesting uh, mesh or surface, this three-dimensional image here. It's very wavy. Um, you can even flatten it out if you want. Um, but I think it's more interesting to look at from an angle here. Again, those warmer temperatures are higher values. Cooler, bluer temperatures are going to be uh, lower values on the z-axis. I generated this with uh, x running from 0 to 50, y running from negative pi to pi, and then I used mesh grid to get an all-pairs calculation between all of these values. So capital X and capital Y here, I don't recommend those variable names because it's very confusing, but capital X and capital Y are matrices generated from these vectors. And then I take the sign of the product of those matrices to determine how high up should the point be above that X, Y coordinate on the surface. So basically I generate my surface, my flat plane of what are all the coordinates that I want. I get all pairs of those coordinates. And then my Z matrix right here contains the height at that point. And that's how I generate this graph right here. Well, and then I use the mesh command. And instead of passing in one value, let me scroll up here, right? Here I just passed in a matrix. And it just decided, MATLAB just decided what the X and Y axes should be based on the number of rows and columns of that matrix. But down in this example, I can specify what my X axis is, what my Y axis is, and then the Z values above those axes. In fact, let's compare this graph that I've got right here to just mesh Z without the X and Y inputs. And let me actually do it as a separate figure so I can put those side by side. All right, can you spot the difference between these two figures? It's probably pretty hard on the video, but I'll zoom in and you can see that the axes are different. If you wanna specify the axes, you have to pass in those vectors yourself. Continuing on down. So here's another surface. I think it looks a little bit like an egg carton, or at least part of an egg carton. And this is very similar to the previous example. I got two vectors. I didn't really need to get two separate vectors. These are the exact same values in X and Y. And then I used mesh grid to generate matrices based on those. And then if I take the sine of X plus the cosine of Y to generate the heights, 
and then use mesh right there, this is what I end up with. Put a title on, X label, Y label, Z label, and grid on to get it looking sharp and fancy. Continuing on down to surface down here, it's gonna be the exact same graph. It's just gonna use the surf command instead of the mesh command. So you see surf right there. And it's just that the cells are actually colored in, right? Rather than left white, and it only colors in the framework, this is actually gonna fill in those tiles with color. And so you can use whichever you prefer. Let's look at some more examples here. I'm gonna put them all on the same uh, subplot right here. Now the first two, the upper left and the upper right, are just uh, mesh and surf. And then there's some new stuff coming up. So I use subplot, mesh, upper left, subplot, surf, upper right, and then scrolling down, subplot contour, passing in X, Y, and Z. And I get this lower left graph. I think of it like a topological map. Like if you've ever been hiking and you've had to use one of these topological or maybe topographical maps, basically when you walk in a direction where you cross one of the lines, that indicates that you're either going uphill or downhill. Now in our diagram, the cooler colors, if you cross a cooler color or you're headed toward colder colors, you're going downhill. And if you head toward warmer colors, you're going uphill. So these are all the same data in all these. And then the fourth one, I'm not sure how useful this is, but surf C is a combination of the uh, surface graph and the contour graph beneath it. And all these can be grabbed and looked at from different angles. Continuing on down, P color and interp. All right, so this I like to think of as a heat map, basically. So again, my data itself is not terribly important. I'm using the same data, I believe, as the previous section. I've got an X vector, a Y vector, and then this uh, calculation on the matrices, so the heights above those X and Y values, is what I'm putting in Z. It's got a X times E raised to the negative X squared minus Y squared to generate these hill and valley pair. And then the first one, I graph with P color. P color parentheses, X, Y, and Z. Reminder, X and Y are vectors. Z is a matrix. So the dimensions are very different, and you could use the size function or the height and width functions to uh, interrogate these variables and determine their dimensions. And the lower graph here is also generated using P color. I just put in shading flat. Now color map cool, I also put in, but that's by default. And so here are just a few other options for shading and for the color map. So for example, let's change the color map to autumn and then let's change shading to uh, faceted maybe. I don't even remember what all these do, but I just wanted to show some examples. All right, so shading faceted is the default, but color map autumn changes from all those cold colors to very hot, very warm colors. I wouldn't even call this autumn, I would call this summer, or I don't know, very hot colors, I would say. Interp is uh, basically gonna be a blurring effect. So instead of all those grid lines, or instead of just shading in the individual cells where you'd see like the rectangles, interp is short for interpolate, and it's basically going to average out the values uh, across the different cells. There is not more data in this lower graph than there is in the top one. You might think there is because the top one is very discrete and the bottom one looks continuous. That is an illusion created by the interpolation. Continuing on down, uh, sphere here, um, it's just sphere and then parentheses. I believe it does have some inputs, but you'll have to look those up for yourself. Oh, and I forgot to put in a close all. So it did, cre it did create the sphere, but it's hidden in the background, which is, I think, a common mistake. I could alt tab over to it. In fact, there, or place the bottom graph. That's not really what I wanted. Um, so I recommend putting close all and then rerunning. So anyway, here's sphere. Um, I don't really do anything particularly with sphere. Uh, I just want to note or remind you that you can always click on this save icon right here and you can save your figure in a variety of formats, uh, MATLAB figure, so you could only reload it back in MATLAB really. There's also JPEG and uh, PDF and PNG and a variety of, a bunch of file formats really, uh, so you could save it if you wanted to. Now that's pretty much it for three-dimensional plotting. I know it's just kind of a quick breezy intro into it. If you're one of my students, I'm not really gonna test you on this material, I just wanted to share it with you. I had a student ask at one point about vector fields and then I just like looked up this example. And of course, you can also uh, get this example either online or through this code, uh, link in the video description. 
This example will not work in Octave. Now, this line of code right here, the loading in of the wind data, is what doesn't work initially. I haven't even tried any of the rest of it with some other data source, but um, it's very unimportant to my course in particular. And so I'm just kind of throwing the code in here. Um, I'm not going to explain it. I'm just going to just sort of demonstrate, hey, look, it's a vector field. It's a field that, I mean, this is wind data. You could imagine like how is wind or a fluid flowing through it? Or I always think of like magnetic filings responding to a magnet. So like a magnetic field you could be looking at. Anyway, you can experiment more with this data. Uh, uh, and then the quiver function, which is kind of funny because like a quiver has to do with arrows and it generates, of course, these graphs with a bunch of arrows. So anyway, vector fields you can do in MATLAB. There's many, many, so many things you can do in MATLAB that I just don't have time or even necessarily knowledge without studying it myself to cover. That's all for this video. Next video is going to be an exercise and then we're going to move on to user-defined functions beyond that.